Thank you so much for coming on such a beautiful afternoon. Uh, my name is Terry Siegel. Uh, I, I, I used to work for Tip O'Neill, and Tip O'Neill uh, had two press secretaries. I was one, and the other was Chris Matthews. <laughs> he went. <laughs> He went on to television, and I went on to a career in Boston trying cases. But I was always addicted to trial pra to uh, politics, so this fits in. To my left is Jesse Brill. To my right, Chuck Lewis, uh, classmates. Uh, we are going to try to give you some personal observations on the 2004 election. Uh, for me, it started in August of 2004. I was in my law office in Boston minding my own business and very excited because a Democratic convention was coming to Boston. I had been to five Democratic conventions and the main highlight was, for me was the governor's reception at Fenway Park because you got a chance to hit out there in the batting cage. And then I get a call from my son, a graduate of this college, and he says, Dad, we have to go and hear this fellow named Obama. And I said, who? He said, Barack Obama, he's giving the uh, main address, the keynote address at the Democratic Convention. And I had been to a lot of Democratic conventions. You get sort of cynical because I was there when Bob Kennedy spoke in 64 and this great tribute to his brother, John Kennedy. And I was there in 68 in Chicago where, Mayor, where uh, Senator Ribicoff excoriated Mayor Daley for what went on in the city of Chicago that day. And... I was there in, in 92 with a, a young fellow from Hope, Arkansas, who just electrified the crowd. And I said, geez, how much can this guy do? Uh, but we went, and I'm not going to summarize it too much. It was just dramatic. When, when this young man gets up and talks about we're not red state, black, uh, red, you know, blue and red states, we're, we're the Americas. It was, it was the most dramatic moment I had heard in five conventions. And I said, how did I miss this fellow? I've never heard of him. Well, the fellow to my right who was, had a great career in investment banking and in due diligence had, been do, had done his due diligence on Barack Obama at least six years before. Chuck Lewis? Picking up on what Terry said about uh, who is this guy, let me just start with a little anecdote, and that was um, 2003, about the time that I met uh, now President Obama. Um, there was a gathering at the White House uh, of congressional, uh, the, the, the congressional delegation, uh, and Jan Schakowsky, who is my congresswoman from Evanston, Illinois, was at this gathering, and she uh, walked up and shook the president's hand, and she had an Obama button on. This is you know two years after 9/11, and uh, you could see that he noticed this button and was kind of startled, and he thought it said Osama. <laughs> yeah. And she noticed that he was startled, and she said, oh, no, no, it's not what you think, Mr. President. Um, this is a fellow named Barack Obama, and he's running for Senate from my state of Illinois. And the president, in turn, said, oh, I've never heard of him. And she, in turn, immediately said, oh, Mr. President, you will. <laughs> Which is uh, typical of this whole conversation, I think. Uh, I, met, uh, I met Barack and uh, President Obama in um, 2003, as I said. And uh, after spending some, uh, my wife and I spent some time with him alone, um, I thought it was too good to be true. And being an investment banker, I started to check him out. And... Uh, Nice word is due diligence. The real world, world real term is snooping around. And uh, I do a lot of work at the University of Chicago. I'm on the board there as well as here. And um, so I started asking about him. And I could go on and on, but I know now probably three or four dozen people who've known him in his um, adult life at some point. Probably the most telling of those, the one that made the most sense to me, was I found a half a dozen guys who played pickup basketball with him. Um, and for, for the guys in the room and some of the younger women in the room who play pickup basketball, uh, you can tell a lot about a person when you're playing uh, without knowing the person. You know, when strangers have 
gone gone to a basketball court and started to play, and true personalities come out. And it checked out that he is, as he presents himself, uh, skillful, uh, team player, not a hot dog, uh, played by the rules, um, intense, etc. So that's that's one of the due diligence. And and not afraid to take the shot when it counts. And not afraid to take the shot when it counts. Chuck, Very did you good. do any due diligence on Michelle Obama? Uh, yeah, I met her a little bit uh, later. Um, she was a, uh, an executive at the University of Chicago. Um, uh, the last job she had was executive vice president in the medical center. And she uh, joined a board that we had uh, been composing um, for the urban ed- what is now the Urban Education Institute, and I'm on that board. Uh, so we, I saw her in that context, too. And she is um, also, as she seems, we did a lot of checking, checking her out, too, um, uh, just salt of the earth, um, uh, uh, solid south, south side of Chicago, if people know Chicago, south side of Chicago, solid African-American, blue-collar family, um, and then Princeton, Harvard Law School, and the whole thing. Uh, so she's she checked out as well. All right. Chuck, uh, most freshman senators are sitting in the back of the Senate waiting to give their maiden speech after three years. You know, they're supposed to be seen, not heard. Around 2006, already people are urging him to run for president. Were you involved in that enterprise? Yeah, I should say at the outset, the last time I was interested and involved in presidential politics was with Bobby Kennedy a long time ago. And uh, nobody had really turned me on before. Um, But I got really involved in the Senate campaign uh, with uh, um, Barack Obama and then in 2006, not knowing any better, I started to encourage him to think about running for president. And a lot of people who knew something about it thought I was nuts. The bottom line is, though, in 2007, this freshman senator does announce for president. Well, let's spend a little time on the primary campaign. Um, uh, Terry, before you do, uh, tell us about the first meeting with Barack, Obama, with, uh, Barack and Warren Buffett. Because that was in that time period back then, before the campaign. Yeah, I had I had uh, thought early on that that uh, that Obama should meet Buffett, and um, I I suggested I could probably engineer that. He'd already already accomplished that. So um, he and I took a a ride out to Omaha to meet with with Warren, and we sat for an hour and a half in in uh, his daughter Susie's kitchen one morning talking about. Uh, executive compensation, among other things, which Jesse will yeah. talk about later. And, and that was, the, I think, the fall of 2005. And the reason I know that is my son, who is also an Amherst graduate, who went to the University of Chicago Law School, was viewing an Amherst-Williams game there, you know, where you gather locally to see the game. And he told me he ran into this guy from my class, Chuck Lewis. And he was impressed because Chuck Lewis talked, mentioned something about a meeting with Chuck and... Warren Buffett and Barack Obama, and I said, Nathan, you know what this means? He said, yeah, Chuck knows some important people. I said, it also means that Barack Obama is going to be running for president. So that's, that's, that was my first clue. <laughs> the, most tel- the most telling thing that meeting, the first, the first question out of um, then Senator Obama's mouth to, to Buffett was, uh, why, why um, uh, are CEOs paid the way they are? He thought it was egregious in many cases. And um, uh, is, it a fun, is it a matter of greed? And Warren said, no, it's a matter of envy. <laughs> Which I think, is a, I think is a fabulous insight. <laughs> All right. The campaign starts up, and, and one of the, we'll try to hit just some of the highlights uh, that, from our point of view, but I remember the New Hampshire primary, the, the press, if you, if you read the press, you thought, Obama lost the primary. What's your take on this, Chuck? And Chuck, every month, would send out this very detailed Obamagram analyzing the campaign. And finally, I sent him a note. I had had the privilege of going to law school with Jeff Greenfield, who was one of the great political analysts. of I said, Greenfield should step aside for you, Chuck. You've analyzed this thing very well. Give us your take, New Hampshire and the polls and and the way the media was trying to drive this campaign. Well, it... 
uh, Obama announced in February of 2007, and I was already deeply convinced that this guy made sense for this job. So, um, but I didn't know enough. I didn't know much about the process. So I started to educate myself a little bit. So I I started to. I thought, well, here's an old guy, and but he but he knows how to use email. So I th- thought I'd start to write some. Um, short email messages and send them out to some friends and colleagues. Um, and uh, in hindsight, not very creatively, I called them Obamagrams. And that's that's the thing that was handed out. An example is one that was handed out. This one's from March of 08. I wound up writing about 42 of them. I sent them to about 500 of my friends and colleagues and, and then encouraged them to pass them along. I started it to... Um, explain the process to myself primarily, and then and to vouch for Obama, for those people who introduce him and vouch for him, for those people who have never heard of him, like President Bush. And, um, um, and then uh, as I got further into it, this is kind of the Amherst education, I realized that a lot of the press coverage was off. Um, uh, for all sorts of reasons, which we could go into. Um, and I started going to the primary source documents, which is what we learned here. You know, don't take the secondary sources, but go to the primary sources. Um, and uh, later in the campaign, uh, the one I handed out, I, I tried to come up with a metaphor for what was going on. So I used the be- metaphor of baseball. And you can read about this uh, later, but I basically said this is the Democratic side or the American League versus the Republican side or the National League have different different rules. Um, and the uh, – I won't go through them all, but the, but, uh, the, the Democrats were going to play this one very long baseball game and had 56 innings. <laughs> and each inning would be played over a six-month period, and they'd be played in – a different stadia in different states, you know, 50 states plus the six territories and, um, uh, and districts, District of Columbia, um, et cetera, et cetera. But we're, we were playing baseball here, not tennis, uh, meaning that a cumulative score matters. doesn't matter who wins every inning. Now, if you're reading the press at the time, you had the impression – because that every inning was important and that who won some particular state really mattered, which it didn't. Um, so you can read that, that detailed metaphor. So I, I, um, I then started to, to – uh, let's see if we can – can we put that on the screen? We've, I handed out this chart, this delegate chart, delegate count chart, and – some of this stuff is really fun. Um, a couple of quizzes. Um, who won New Hampshire? Didn't win New Hampshire. If you look at the chart, um, Hillary won the popular vote in New Hampshire, 39-37, but they tied in delegates. Okay. Um, the same thing happened in Nevada. People said Hillary won Nevada. Well, Obama actually won Nevada, 13 to 12. I had to ask you who won Super Tuesday. And most people think Hillary won Super Tuesday. In fact, Obama, Obama won at 848 to 833. And the, the deal is that it was all about pledged delegates it wasn't about this state or that state. And, and everybody got confused because the Republicans were winner-take-all. So if you won one more uh, vote in a state, you got all of the delegates. Here, it was uh, a very different proportional deal. Uh, the other, uh, another one is who won Texas? Yeah. Uh, we'll come to Texas, and I'll come back to the other um, the, the, everybody announced, and this, uh, and the, the Obamagram talks, the one you have in your hands talks about this. Immediately announced uh, Hillary won Texas. Well, it's not true. Obama won Texas, ninety-nine to forty-four. She won the first step, which was the primary. 
He won the second step bigger, which was the caucus, happened on the same day, but the caucus results took longer to report. Uh, So the news media forever said uh, uh, she won Texas, which she didn't. The last thing which is fascinating to me is this period after Super Tuesday. So there's Super Tuesday, February 5th. And then there was this string from February 9th to uh, February 21st. Um, Dems abroad is kind of out of order there. Um, There were 11 straight wins. That over on the right-hand side, that's how it was reported, that Obama wins 11 straight states. Well, who cares? The fact is that he he won them by such substantial margins that uh, 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 the contest was effectively over on February 21st. If you look at the percentages, starting with Louisiana down through Wisconsin, if you look at the voting percentages, the two college columns with percents in them, you'll see big, big uh, gaps, you know, huge wins. Uh, but, but even that doesn't tell the whole story because in all the states except Wisconsin, uh, he got at least 60% of the pledged delegates. You can't do that arithmetic in your head, most of you. I can't. So in, uh, the real story was that in 10 of the 11 states, he beat her by uh, pledged delegates. He beat her more, more than 60-40. So the lead was so substantial by the 21st of February, that the content, it was effectively over. Now, the reason that the press, I, who knows what the motivations are, my, uh, my suspicion would be that uh, much, much of the press didn't dig into it as much as they should. They didn't know the rules as well as they should. Uh, I think you can even uh, uh, conclude in hindsight that Perhaps some of the other campaigns didn't know the rules as well as they should. Um, but also, I think there's the motivation. Of everybody loves a horse race. So let's keep this going until June, till the very last primary. So let's find every possible way to, to uh, contort it and keep the interest up. There was also this thing about pledged delegates, which I talk about in the handout. Um, and pledged delegates... Uh, seem to have been designed almost like baseball owners that um, if the game was being played according to the rules uh, that they um, that the owners stay on the sidelines they only intervene if something's uh, happening that's not in the best interest of baseball but after Obama's lead got to the point that it did after um, uh, February 21st um, Then there were all sorts of moves to change the rules of the game and uh, to try to steal the game in the name of superdelegates. So the superdelegates should forget what the voters are saying. They should turn this from a baseball game into a gymnastics meet. Okay, And the judges decide on the basis of subjective backroom. Uh, And that's one of the reasons uh, reasons I wrote that that, um, Obamagram you have in your hands, too, that just warning people, don't let don't let anybody steal this from us. Um, Chuck, what was your take on Obama's campaign versus Clinton on the caucus states where Obama had huge wins? What was the strategy and how did it play out? Well, we saw some of it personally in Iowa. My, my wife, who's not here today, she's at her 45th reunion at Grinnell College in Iowa. And we went there to work uh, for the campaign prior to the, the Iowa caucus, which was so key. Um, and you could just feel it on the ground. You could feel the community organizer on the ground. So we're in Grinnell, Iowa. Um, ironically, the, the precinct with the most delegates in the whole state of Iowa. Uh, Obama had a very vibrant um, storefront office with a kid running it and volunteers running out and Given, given us orders, and, uh, and uh, Senator Clinton was nowhere to be seen. The no, no presence in the precinct that was the biggest precinct in the state of Iowa. We went to the caucus that night as observers, and she was not viable, meaning that you had to get at least 15% of the people caucusing to 
vote for you, if you didn't get to that level of 15% of the participants, you got flushed out, you got no delegates, and your, dele- your people had to redistribute themselves. Just a couple of quick observations, Chuck, on uh, the McCain campaign and the selection of uh, Governor Palin. Well, I, I thought two things, and I wrote about these two things. Again, this, remember I'm an amateur, so that this may, may or may not be right, but um, I thought um, I thought that the general campaign was basically over on August 28, not November 4th or whatever it was. And I think the reason was that that was when um, uh, Senator McCain picked Sarah Palin. And that was simple, not, not necessarily what played out afterwards, but just an act of desperation. Um, we were coming back uh, from the convention, the first convention I'd ever been to, unlike Terry. And we were at the airport, and we ran into um, – um, what's Schieffer's first name? Bob Schieffer. Bob Schieffer at the airport. And he's on his BlackBerry – scrambling to figure out who Sarah Palin was. And we sat next to him uh, in a coffee shop. Um, and he'd never heard of her. So I thought that, you know, McCain had the best insight of anybody uh, in what was going on in the general. So by making that move, I said, yeah, there's the first shoe. And then the second shoe that confirmed it was in late September when he suspended his campaign. Another desperate, desperate move. And I, I learned here, at least I learned in high school or something, two points make a straight line. Um, so it seemed to be over at that point. Let me give you a, one personal observation from that campaign. Uh, uh, my wife, Dale, who's with me today, and I went up to New Hampshire. We live in Massachusetts, and they worked it out for people from Massachusetts to go up and help Obama in the fall campaign in New Hampshire, and we went up to Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Now, I had been in New Hampshire in 2004. My best friend in law school was Joe Lieberman, and I spent three or four weeks there with him, and then I worked with Senator Kerry's campaign, so I knew something about the state and about how it the ebb and flow. We went up to Portsmouth, and they had a storefront, a former stop and shop, walked in. Every... 20 minutes, a very articulate young woman from Chicago was giving a 25-minute presentation on how to canvas in the, in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and then they'd send us out with a map and all this material. And this was happening every 25 minutes. There must have been, while we were in that headquarters, 300 people. I had never seen such enthusiasm. We then went out and canvassed the area in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and you bring, and this is no, you know, it's standard operating procedure. You know, if somebody's favorable, a one, a one, and if not, two, three, four, five, or I can't reach them. And it was a Saturday afternoon in the fall, and most people were out. And what they asked us to do, they had their, all their phone numbers, come back to the headquarters and call those that you hadn't been able to reach. And we reached maybe 20% of the people, the 75 we had been assigned. And I came in, it was 430 and. You know, I'm, I'm a little on the back nine, and I said, geez, I'd love to go back to Gloucester and have a lobster. I will call those people from my house tonight and tomorrow morning. I promise you, I have those. Mr. Siegel, don't bother. We have a whole new team going out tomorrow, and we'll hit that those houses and apartments three times before Election Day. And I said, I have never seen an operation. They knew every house who was going to vote for them they had this down. I mean, it was an unbelievable, well-organized, volunteer effort with people with, you know, there wasn't a telephone in the place. Everybody was on computers. And I said at that point, I said, this man is going to win because it's just so, I've never seen that enthusiasm and organization in a campaign in, in 40 years. <laughs> Chicago politics. Well, <laughs> I, I know time's resting. I will give you one Chicago story now that you mentioned that. <laughs> My old boss, Tip O'Neill, was an advance man for President Kennedy in 1960. And his job was to go to Chicago a week before the senator was coming in. 
and he, he had understood Mayor Daley doesn't like advancement, but Tip O'Neill's a big Irishman, about 240. He figures he could talk. Mr. Mayor, I'm here to set up the trip for Senator Kennedy. And Daley reaches into his drawer. He says, you see these chips? Go over to Calumet City and use them for the next week. I don't want to see you again. <laughs> I said, what did you do? He said, I went over to Calumet City. <laughs> well, two days later, he's getting a call. What are you doing? And he tells the story. You better go back and see the mayor. Mr. Mayor, didn't I tell you to stay over there? <laughs> yes. I, all right. This is now Wednesday, and the candidate's coming in Friday, and there's nothing. He says, all right. At midnight, you'll be on the corner of, what's it, the main drag there in Chicago? Uh, the state in Washington state Street. Madison, yeah. At 2, 2 a.m. All right. <laughs> this is beyond. He says, I was on that corner, and at every corner, a truck came, and people were there, and within six or eight hours, they had that city completely uh, littered, you know, littered, but, you know, material passed out ward by ward, and they gave them a ticket tape parade, and they had everybody lined up, and within three or four days, that organization was able to turn out, you know, an unbelievable... Uh, reception for Senator Kennedy and it was not surprising as Tip and others said that on election night when things got very close very late at night uh, then Senator Kennedy because it was going to come down to Illinois called Mayor Daley how are we doing Mr. Mayor he said Senator with a little luck and a couple of close friends you'll be fine in the state <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> now Barack Obama is elected. Uh, we are going to talk about two things going forward, but one is executive comp. But before we do, uh, let's talk a little about the economic future. Uh, ch uh, Chuck, on, uh, on April 15th of this year, Barack Obama gave a very important speech at Georgetown University on the economy. Unfortunately, on that day, I guess Britney Spears had a nosebleed, went to the hospital... <laughs> His speech was on, you know, page 84, two lines. What did he say? What's his program for going forward, Chuck? Well, um, I'd, I'd say two things. One is that um, David Brooks, who's a favorite of mine, uh, uh, said of that speech, this is a speech at Georgetown, where he uh, tried to lay out in a comprehensive way what his uh, program was going forward and why he was choosing to tackle three major areas all at once when a lot of people are saying you're nuts you can't do one thing let alone three um, so I commend the speech to you you, you can um, um, I, we'll see if this works um, some people have asked whether they could see these 42 things I've written so far and I keep writing uh, occasionally um, and I've, I've written about this, this speech um, which didn't get much press uh, wasn't Printed in whole in the New York Times, um, actually wasn't didn't, didn't get much coverage in the Times even. Um, I, I wrote about that and a, a, a companion piece that Jamie Dimon wrote, a, a, a 28 page letter to shareholders in his annual report for J.P. Morgan Chase, which is a, a remarkable piece of of uh, literature which you should also uh, read. Uh, I've, I've I've gone to the uh, extent of starting a little um, uh, rudimentary website uh, where these things are posted, including um, my Obamagram on that on those two speeches, and they're attached, so you can read them. Uh, on the bottom of this yellow page, there's a there's a, a URL for that website. I'm using a you know a free site that Google makes available, um, and we're experimenting with it, see if it works. But I commend that speech to you. It shows you how he thinks strategically and, and uh, uh, comprehensively. I, I would say one other thing that, um, you know, he doesn't have some label like New Frontier or a New Deal or anything, but some people have started to say, and I think this is probably true, that um, it may go down in history that he's, what he's trying to do is lay a new foundation. Um, for going forward, so I think that's what he's really up to: is trying to uh, think strategically, long term, and holistically, um, and trying to move the society from a a, a borrow and spend uh, to a save and invest, with the emphasis on investment, real investment. Um, 
So I th- that speech kind of lays it out, and I, I commend it to you. Uh, to my left is probably the leading authority in the country on executive compensation, our classmate Jesse Brill, who publishes three different newsletters, the Corporate Council, the Corporate Executive, and the Compensation Standards, which are really the Bibles in the legal area. But Jesse has been a voice in the wilderness on excessive corporate compensation for years and decided to also, besides proselytizing in these different journals, get involved in this subject in the campaign. Uh, The TARP legislation was before Congress in September. Uh, Jesse, what did you try to do there, and what what was the result? Thanks, Terry. Uh, First of all, I've never been to a convention. I've never been interested in politics. I've always had a very skeptical view of the self-interest that most politicians have. Uh, This campaign was the first, even going back to the Kennedys, the first that I've ever had any real interest and excitement over. Um, As far as executive compensation um, and and what I've been trying to do and how this affects us and the administration and what's going forward, uh, primarily in the past I've been an advisor to other lawyers. I'm a lawyer, and uh, lawyers have subscribed to our publications for guidance on... uh, on how they in turn advise their corporate clients. And about five or six years ago when my wife was saying to me, isn't it time to slow down and retire? I said, yes, but there's one more thing I feel I have to do because I have the perspective that few people have, talking to the lawyers, talking to the compensation consultants, the directors, the CEOs. I know all the different players in this. I know what's gone wrong. And I think I know a few key things that can turn things around and fix. Well, it's not so easy, as you know. And uh, I'm not one to tilt at windmills, I, but I'm not one who's afraid of taking on challenges. Um, so even when, when the TARP legislation came out, there were some things, and I was really upset at the time that nobody had come to me. Maybe it was my ego or whatever. <laughs> but because there were some simple things. It's, it, everything looked good on paper. Congress, you know, passed it. Uh, but there were some simple things that anybody really close to it would understand, like uh, they did put a cap on compensation that we all hear about, uh, this $500,000 cap, but there are loopholes to that, and you can get around it. Uh, for example, it's only for from a tax deduction standpoint that you can deduct up to $500,000 of compensation. You can give $10 million of compensation. There's no restriction. There's no real cap. It's simply that the amount between the 500000 and the $10 million is not tax deductible to the company. So the shareholders suffer even more, but the companies do it. Uh, so that's one area that they didn't even provide for any kind of disclosure mechanism. Another simple fix is uh, everybody talks about it's a good thing to give stock, restricted stock, as compensation. Uh, it's good, uh, that is, if you have it focused on the long term. So if you don't have a provision in there that says you have to hold your gain uh, until retirement or actually through retirement so you can't retire just before the bad news is coming out, again, you're not going to have that long-term focus if you know you can dump that stock at the high of the market and walk away. So it's simple fixes like this, simple to me, but fixes that others don't see. So I've been railing away in my newspapers again you know the lawyers who who you know some of them thought has brill gone off the deep end uh but they had to pay attention because i built up all that goodwill and credibility to the point where others had begun to read the press had picked up on me a couple of times the today show called me for an interview all of that kind of stuff but i'm still saying to myself i'm not reaching and chuck has heard my lament several times you know this is great but you know, we're the decision makers, what's going on? Because so far, I'm, well, uh, I, I'm happy to report that persistence pays off. Uh, and when you're in the right and you know you're right, then you persist. And that, that applies to every one of us in, in, in anything we're doing. And uh, I can't say too much, but I can say to you that unlike other administrations, uh, there are people working now who are working day and night, from like 6 o'clock in the morning till 11.30 at night, and I can attest to that. Uh, and, and they're not just looking for surfacey ways to fix things. They're looking at fundamental kinds of fixes. Uh, and uh, 
some of the questions they ask and, uh, and, and, and the goals that they have, you know, really give you an insight into, into, into how serious they are about, about their commitment. So I do have a lot of hope. Now, let me, uh, one last thing. I know we're running late uh, on, on time, but in terms of, you know, what the president has said about, you know, it's not just him, each and every one of us has something to do, it, it truly is correct. Uh, go away from my example, but I'll, I'll give a couple of other little things that each and every one of us can and should be doing because the future of the country really is up to us. I, I talk in front of large groups, uh, uh, and before I speak, every time, there are two things that I remind everybody in the group because it's something if you have an audience and if you can make a difference, take advantage of it. One is prostate cancer. Every single one of you in the audience who is a male and anyone who's got, got a loved one, it, 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 you need to not only just have those annual blood tests, but and you can't rely on the doctor to say everything's fine. In my case, I'd had a 0. 0.6 for years, which is a low reading for a PSA, went to 1.2, uh, and uh, I said to the doctor, shouldn't I be concerned? The doctor said, no, not till it's a 3 or a 4. Uh, so I took it upon myself to have another test three months later. It's now at a 1.7. I went back to the doctor. He said, what are you bothering me for? I told you, not till a 3. <laughs> I took it upon myself to go to a, a, you know, a specialist, a urologist, one of the tops in the country. And he, too, was saying, uh, watchful waiting. And I said, no watchful waiting. I, it's my life. And, and then I found out that there was family history that I didn't know about uh, because people are reluctant to talk about it. The message that I want to give to you, that I give to the audience every time and tell to everybody else, it's not just enough to, to rely on the doctor saying it's okay. You have to take things into your own hands, so to speak, and you've got to then pay attention and do what's necessary to, because it's your own life at stake. Doctors are too busy to do it. Now, this applies to the healthcare system. You know, if we had preventive things that each of us were doing, the cost of health care would be down. So it's that. It's watching cholesterol levels. So, so that's one easy example. Second example, food. When we do these big conferences, we've got huge amounts of food. Does anybody stop to think, what does the hotel, what does the caterer do with that, all that leftover food? We insist that they have an arrangement where they bring over whatever the local soup kitchen is, whatever the, the local organization, to pick up all the leftover food. I question, for example, does any of us question here, with any events we go to, you know, if our companies hold events, our law firms, think of what's going on now. What they do with the leftover food at lunch? What's going to happen with the leftover from, from yesterday's meals? What's happening with the leftover food tonight? Nobody asks, nothing happens. Each one of us is in a position, in a little way like that, to help the hunger situation, you know, in terms of the poor and the underprivileged. So each of you, in your own walk of life, is in a position to make a difference. And that's what it's really all about. We can't just wait for someone on high. One last thing for Amherst. Yesterday, the same kind of thing. I stood up in front of our class and said, you know, in fact, and this is something we all need to be aware of, Amherst's uh, endowment is down about 25% because of the stock market. Uh, the giving this year is down about 25%. And some of us who are in a position to, to give, even if our assets are down somewhat, have to really step up. So last night I said to the class, you know, I'll put on a match for anybody who adds the amount that they give uh, while they're here. Uh, I'll match it up to $25,000. Well, a couple of our guys in our class got together. And now for anybody, any single class tonight, and please mention this at every one of your dinners tonight, that there are these guys from the class of 64 who are going to match up to $150,000 for, for new money. This is money, whether you've given or already or not, if you add to it, give to it. Uh, and the other thing, an additional $5,000 for any class that reaches 100% attendance, because the way the, 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 the uh, magazines that rank colleges, it's not just how much money you raise, it's what percentage of the alumni contribute. So even if you've got people, you know, many of us are in walks of life where we haven't made a lot of money, but anybody can afford a dollar, and a dollar is all it takes. So any class that can get 100% attend attendance, uh, you know, 100% Particip participation would be another five. Just so please tell everybody tonight, and again, the whole idea is lives of consequence. We're all in a position to do it. I'll get off the platform. Jesse, uh, one final thought on uh, executive comp. Without going into details, I know you've had discussions with various people in the administration, and 
I know for a fact, since my son works for the TARP, uh, uh, he, work, he, he sleeps about three hours a day, so you, what you say is accurate. But uh, if you were to project ahead, what, if any, what do you see on the horizon legislatively in this area? It, it, it's, it's a tough one to know. I mean, you may see this, this concept that I mentioned about hold through retirement, that you have to hold 50% of that equity that you've gotten from, uh, and that will give people a longer-term focus. That's something you may see come out within the next month. You may see some something. I, I can't control what's going on, but that's one concept. Another is something called internal pay equity. You know, you're reading the papers about how the CEO's compensation has gotten so far away from the average worker. Well, it's not just the average worker. It's the next tiers of executives, and that erodes the entire work ethic within the company. You know, if the executives themselves look at the guy at the top and say, boy, he's gotten totally out of touch. So there's some key fixes like hold through retirement, like return to a sane uh, ratio between the executive, the top executive, and the next tiers of executives. If you get rid of things like severance provisions like that, all of that we may find coming into play, whether it's going to be legislation or the other thing I like a lot is for a lot of the key uh, CEOs. Uh, Chuck mentioned Jamie Dimon, who is a very, very sharp uh, CEO. Uh, who understands executive comp. If Jamie Dimon, if Jeff Immelt, the CEO of, of, Pe- of, of, uh, of GE, if the impressive CEO of PepsiCo, some of these kinds of people and others get together and stand up and speak out and say, we've gotten rid of or we're getting rid of these aspects, we're returning to these concepts. And each of these, these CEOs has said things individually. If they come out in a group and say it and say to others, we need to join force. That's another way outside of legislation for all of us to get back to the basic values. Jamie Dimon's over at Citigroup. Is that right, Jesse? J.P. Morgan Chase. J.P. Morgan, J.P. Morgan Chase. Uh, the question I have, and I, I don't see our classmate Joe Stieglitz here, but Joe is going to be on shortly. I mean, he's the Paul Samuelson of his day, and I think he wants to nationalize the banks, and I understand that. And you can legislatively restrict compensation if the government, he who pays the fiddler, calls the tune. But how can you legislatively restrict compensation in private companies that have taken no money for the, from the government or returned every dollar that they ever got from the TARP? Yeah, and it's a good question, and not only that, but when the government has tried to do it, they've done it in the past with uh, that, that million-dollar cap, as I said. It used, there is a million-dollar cap that applies to all public companies. You ask that, how come CEOs are making so much? Well, it's the same thing. They structured it in such a way, and then uh, Treasury interpreted it in such a way that one exception to that million-dollar cap is performance-based compensation. So performance-based compensation is anything from stock options to bonus plans that you structure in a way that they're, quote, performance-based. Bottom line is, it didn't do any good. Uh, Government tries to put caps on things like uh, uh, payouts, uh, golden parachutes. They put a three times your uh, compensation. Uh, But again, if if you exceed three times, it just means that you pay a tax on it. So the company reimburses them for the tax. So every time the government tries to do something, it tends to backfire because they're not seeing all the various ramifications. We have time for one or two questions. Yes, sir. Right in front of me. Go ahead. Could you stand up so everybody could hear you, please? Well, you can hear me. Go ahead. Uh, That's fine. (laughs) You this 90% tax that the uh, AIG executives got hit with. Um, (laughs) That struck me as kind of coronist, but I'm curious as to what your view is on it. Well, again, it's... It, 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 Does everybody understand what that tax... It wasn't just AIG, I think, because my son had been working at Goldman. He told me he was affected by... I don't by, think it was passed. This was the thing the Senate... Did, the House pa- passed... I don't, I don't think it passed. It, it passed the House uh, and then went to the Senate, and, uh, you know, the, it's been quiet ever since. But I, I spoke to Congressman Hodes up in New Hampshire. I said, how did you vote for that? He said, the barbarians were at the gates. Well, the point was there was tremendous public outrage at AIG, but... Uh, go ahead, Jesse. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think you're going to see. You know, cooler heads will prevail. I, you know, as they say, they're, they're, I, I, I think they're thinking in very clear, fundamental ways. The people doing this are very bright and very considered. So I don't think you're going to see rash stuff like that actually happening. Yes, right here, sir. Yeah, I understand that uh, the there are some funds that are attempting to have some say in corporate management in terms of. It. 
executive compensation. You know, there's been some moves afoot to try to um, have more say what ha rather than have everything rubber stamped. And I wonder um, if there might be some thought of some legislation to improve corporate democracy. Yeah, the, no doubt. The question was uh, that there's this phrase, say on pay, so that shareholders can have a greater say on executive compensation uh, and, and, and the governance, uh, or at least in, in, in the compensation area. And yes, there's no doubt that there will be legislation sometime this year. It's advisory legislation. It's not going to let the shareholders say, here's how much the CEO is going to pay. But it will be like a yay and nay, a vote of approval on the actions of the compensation committee. And that's one of the things that you know people say, well, if it's only advisory, uh, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is that uh, directors and CEOs are human beings and very sensitive to their, uh, to, to their reputations, the public perception. And they don't want to experience a situation where in public now, uh, their entire life's uh, reputation is now boiled down to, you know, all this guy cares about is squeezing the last nickel out for, for himself or herself, or, or, and it's usually the himself's uh, 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 for, for either the directors or the CEOs. So the say and pay legislation is going, to have, uh, is going to have an impact. One final question, Jack Crutchfield. Yeah, Chuck, either I was totally asleep in previous presidential campaigns, but it seems the superdelegate issue suddenly reared its head in 2008. Mm -hmm. Are there any, how did this happen? Are there any moves afoot to restructure that? Um, I don't know the whole history. Uh, my guess is it became a major issue in this campaign because of who the two candidates were. So I think it was, was seen as a stopgap measure if this upstart um, you know, w w was in the lead. That's my guess. I, I just ask, we're pontificating here about this stuff. How many of, of people in the room were active in the in, in the Obama campaign? Yeah, <laughs> shows you how uh, how big a movement this was. The history of the super delegates, Jack, is that after the 1972 convention in Miami, which ended at about 4 a.m., and the campaign. Uh, some of the regular Democrats were nervous about the process going forward, and they created the super delegates so that if somebody that they felt was, quote, out of the mainstream was ahead, the super delegates would come in sort of like, you know, adults and try to reverse the process. That was the basis for it. And it's really an, an anachronism now, but that was really what it... But I think Jack's point is a good one. Until this campaign, I don't think most of us ever heard of it before. That's right. All right. Thank you all. We so really one, one, one last thing. Go ahead. One last thing. Now, again, about each of us going back and doing our thing, to begin with here, go to your dinners tonight and speak up. Speak up early in the dinner and get that money so we can help, help, help Amherst and help li Thank extend you. lives of consequence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.